Welcome, B-Movie fans, to this week's episode of B-Movie Chat. Perhaps the most difficult question to answer other than, how much did I drink last night, and where the fuck are my keys, is, what is funny? You can ask 100 different people what they think is funny, and odds are, you'll get close to 100 different answers. Humor is subjective, and everyone seems to have a different opinion on it. However, there does seem to be a certain element in comedy that is nearly universal. While you'll never get everyone on Earth to agree on what is funny, you'll often find different comedy styles that seem to attract large groups of people from all scopes of life. So today we are asking the question, what is funny? Is there a universal answer? Is there a magical formula to make everyone, or at least more people, laugh? And if so, why? Joining us for this chat is filmmaker Tim Carr and the creator of the YouTube series Pool Party, Dan Berger. Tim and Dan, welcome to the show. Hi, guys. Thanks for glad, having us. Glad to be here. Yeah, thanks for joining. So, comedy. This is uh, definitely a fun kind of conversation, definitely a topic that I think most people can relate to. So, um, yeah. In particular, no, I think uh, you, what's it? No, I think you guys make a great point of, like, what's funny? <laughs> um, that's the, kind of the start in everything. Because immediately when you guys started saying that, I started thinking about times people are laughing or even i've laughed and i'm wondering why i laughed you know like if you see like pulp fiction or or like american psycho you know people are laughing at those movies and you have to like what part of me is is laughing at this you know when marcellus wallace is uh gets hit by the car and he shoots and he misses someone and he hits somebody else everyone in the theater is laughing um or if in a in again tarantino with reservoir dogs before Mr. Blonde cuts that cop's ear off. He stands around, and everyone's laughing. It's just like, we don't know. Maybe it's we're uneasy. Maybe it's some sort of uh, way our brain is just trying to kind of balance out what we're watching. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a great point, and it, it really is so yeah. subjective. Yeah, I definitely think the element of surprise is, is important. Definitely, some of those things you mentioned that were, were surprising twists in the, in the movies, and uh, I think people being vulnerable is is always funny. Uh, I think of like Jeffrey Tambor and Larry Sanders show. Yeah. As as a great like vulnerable character, yeah, those are that, that definitely comes to mind at first. You know, just just to capitalize on that, the funniest thing that I saw this week that like was a surprise to me is um you know where I teach preschool we have two bathrooms we have well we have three bathrooms we have one bathroom that's kind of like just for our room and then we have two bathrooms when we go to the uh, to the gym one that's a men's room and one that's a girls' room and uh, or or women's room that. Uh, you know, I took one of my boys yeah. into the men's room, and apparently he'd never seen a <laughs> urinal before, because like, oh, I was yeah. like I was like, you can use the urinal or you can use the stall. He walks over to the urinal, turns around, and like goes to take his pants off, <laughs> like he's gonna sit on the <laughs> urinal. And I just started laughing. I'm like, I'm like, little dude, that's that's not what that's yeah. for. If you're gonna sit down, you gotta go in the stall. <laughs> yeah. Didn't that happen in the movie? Was that was that Kingpin? Did that happen? <laughs> sounds like it. And that's yeah. fantastic. But um, yeah, there's an interesting surprised. thing where I, I work in, in New York um, with uh, UCB and with Upright Citizens Brigade. What their philosophy is, you know, when you guys and I think everybody on this call is uh, or on the show, rather, um, is uh, has been probably guilty of is, you know, when you're telling a story or you're trying to explain something and you try, maybe try to make it interesting, or you try to punch it up and it just veers into like this weird territory for, for them that's when the story becomes alive right there you know where normally as in, in general you sit there and you're like okay i should probably just shut up right now right then per ucb standards that's when it comes to life and keep going down that rabbit hole um so as a result you do get some really weird uh but some interesting stuff you know so yeah. you know, it's, kind of like, it's new comedy that's just kind of happening on the spot and it, it's based from a very weird um interesting dark little place what was the funniest thing I saw this week was that picture of Jared Kushner uh, wearing a blazer in Iraq. <laughs> that was hilarious. Was like, it looked like book. it was a bulletproof yeah. vest for like a, like a junior. Like, play yeah. school's my first bulletproof yeah. vest. Yeah. Yeah. It was the absurdity. It kind of reminded me of Rushmore or something. It's like, it, he's it's exactly, like, yeah, that dude, he's, he's like exactly Max Fisher. Kid. Yeah. Who just he's walked. exactly, he's a uh, exactly failed out of everything. Trying to play at the adult thing, you know. Unbelievable that, comparison, Dan. I'm yeah. jealous that I didn't think of that sooner. <laughs> yeah. I gotta tweet that. I gotta tweet that. No, you better. You better, because I'm about to. <laughs> no. I was, uh, I'll tweet that. <laughs> no, the, funny, the funniest thing I saw this week, and I don't know if you guys are seeing this, um, it's, uh, I guess, a YouTube clip or Vimeo or whatever you guys like to see your, your videos on. That The guy who's singing the Cucumber song, 
No, I have not. It's this, it's this guy. It's just like this great guy. He's like, I guess Jamaican. He's got the accent. And he's making up a song about how useful cucumbers are. And it's just unbelievable. And I, I watched it maybe maybe two weeks ago, but I thought about that guy every single day. I'm like, where is he? What's he doing right now? <laughs> it's it's yeah. unbelievable. I really recommend yeah. it. I'll, yeah, I, I, I just can't get enough of it. I can't speak highly enough of that guy. I hope he's doing great wherever he is. Check it out. Yeah, without a doubt. <laughs> Please, by all means, everyone see this cucumber song. And, and you're going to be singing it to yourself immediately. It's a full <laughs> disclosure. Another thing that's, that can be funny is sort of like rigidity. People... You know, I think the way that people act in, in, in comedy movies and TV shows is like way more, you know, in, in real life, a lot of times, I mean, hey, real life is full of insanity. Look at the uh, airplane incident this week and all that stuff. Yeah. But but uh, but the generally, I think people are more rigid and that leaves some more con- conflicts, you know, whereas in, in real life, sometimes, you know, we, we might just uh, smooth over a, 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 an argument or something and and you know, calm everyone down in, in, in a movie or a TV show. Usually like that'll lead to some, some fireworks, you know? Oh yeah. It's definitely, it's, it's the, uh, judge smells from Caddyshack format. And it's, it's always, <laughs> works, always effective when you have a Rodney Dangerfield <laughs> right next to him too. Um, cause you have, you have the, the, the back and forth. It's fantastic. Um, yeah. it would, I mean, in, in light of, and, and Dan's touching on this, but with the, I, I just can imagine, the, the comedic fastball that Saturday Night Live is going to be this weekend with just this oh particular God, week alone. Um, <laughs> you know, you have to think about how Pepsi. so much comedy is fueled by the, the craziness in the world. How Or, you know, yeah. how sometimes things that are upsetting or uh, things that are unnerving um, can really result in that. I mean, remember when um, the, the first SNL right after 9-11 where Lorne Michaels told Rudy Giuliani, he's like, did we be funny again? And he goes, why well, start now? You know, but that was, yeah. the, that was the laugh that everyone needed. You know, I think that's... Sure. With the, with the crazier the world gets, it needs to be countered maybe with, with something like that to kind of just ease the tension a little bit. Definitely. Yeah, it seems like a lot of comedy is just having things that are slightly out of place, but like, and it kind of just makes things ridiculous. Like you play some, a few elements in a, in a room that shouldn't be there. And I think it's a lot funnier than having like most things that are just completely ridiculous. Like if you get have things that are just complete anarchy. It can be funny, but it has to kind of like build from you know, it. It has to be, be built upon something. Like one of my favorite shows is Seinfeld, and the episode where George's um, fiance dies, and his reaction yeah. is just like, huh. And it was just so hilarious because like, you wouldn't like you know it, it's it's not unexpected because that's George's character. It's like, but it's just seeing it. It's like, wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Unique reaction. Yeah. yeah. I think I think comedy is also a lot about about how you frame like the same events seen through a comedic lens, like a smart comedic lens, like like that. You know, like obviously Larry David is a genius. Um, can really come alive in this funny way. Um, you know, or you take like like uh, Louis C.K. His like stand up. You know, he's he's taking sort of some you know nor uh, very like standard sort of parenting experiences, but he has it through this totally unique lens where he's like showing the absurdity of how children behave like tyrants and you know i think that's that's a big part of what, what makes comedy good is that is that writer performer's voice and and, and their particular lens on the world that they're like you know comedic framework is is important i was trying to explain a thing to my wife the other night about louis ck where he, in one of his stand-up opera, uh, stand-up shows he was talking about being married with children and yeah. uh, he was just he was reduced to jerking off in the basement at midnight near <laughs> heater <laughs> like, that's what, that's no what but that's does. a funny thing that's another thing i've definitely i do some stand-up and it's like when you when you talk about something that no one no one talks about what we all experience that just slays you know on, uh, yeah. especially stand-up yeah but i mean oh, any, yeah, well, any, any comedy yeah and he's great like that the way he can do it because you know it, it's it's great he, he's not only observing his life but he's he's got no problem making himself the butt of the joke yeah and that's why he's one of the best i mean he's just yeah he's fantastic I think, yeah i think uh, you know louis you know chris rock a lot of these guys the the uh, but amy schumer and the female you know sphere is like they're very raw they, they're very real they, they don't i think in stand-up in particular you have to kind of expose everything about yourself uh yeah you know that's what the what does best because it's it just feels real it feels relatable that that first night Dan, you actually, it's a good say. I had actually, it made you, gave me an idea about it. That first Schumer record was fantastic. Um, it was yeah. before she got really too famous, because now she really is very, very famous. I mean, she's doing Madison Square sure. Garden, 
And if you're a stand-up, I mean, that's that's unbelievable. But her first album, I think, was called Cutting. And it was uh, really, really, really funny. And I have to wonder if, at one point, do you get too famous to be funny? You know, like, I'm wondering if Amy doing... Yeah. You know, I think, I think, the, I think and then... It, oh, go ahead. Yeah, it's kind of like the Eddie Murphy thing with Eddie Murphy, where people right. would say to him, you know, why don't you, why don't you just go on the road and do another Raw? And he's like, "There's not a whole lot funny about having a good life." So I'm wondering yeah. if he would ever get because at first, I mean, Amy's still at the top of absolutely the top of her game. But I'm wondering if as cutting and as as big time as that that first uh, uh, record of hers, it's yeah. uh, I, I think, wonder I if think she would have that, another album like that. No, I think you have true. to be kind of miserable or maybe poor or not yeah. as well off to make these I, make these I great music records. Yeah, I recently saw though like Dave Chappelle for the first time in a long time. Uh, and he, I thought it was funny. He was, he like totally embraced that he's now, he now has this, this like very unrelatable life. And he talks about his like white neighbors and stuff. Like, I think if you, if you're real, you know, I think that's what you have to do. If you, if you become more successful, you shouldn't be doing material about, oh yeah, I'm tra- struggling to make the rent. Like you should be talking about the absurdity of your new life. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Just to be <laughs> evolving, evolving the whole, you yeah. know, as, as your life happens, because you know, if Louis CK, he's, he's divorced now. So, you know, him right. talking about being married and everything, it's, it's, you know, he's talking about being a single parent. You know, he's just evolving with, with, his, with his life. And Aziz Ansari, I, I found, is doing, uh, has always been good about doing that, too, where, you know, his first couple records, we're talking about him, you know, with his culture and all of that. And now it's kind of talking about him being in Hollywood and how everyone's crazy and the technology. And it's, uh, yeah, I think you have to evolve with the times. You can't still be doing the same the same shtick after so many years. Um, and I think, I think that's a, that's a big, that's a big component to, to what makes comedy great. Definitely. I think like you said, um, it's gotta be genuine. It's gotta be like honest because if you're joking about like, you know, being in poverty when you're clearly not like, pe- not only is it, can people physically see that it's incorrect, but it's like, it kind of just comes off as so disingenuous in general. It's that, like insulting. Yeah. yeah. It's like, um, yeah. not really like, cause, cause they're not really going to get it. It's like, okay. Um, not really guys. Uh, exactly. And, that, and I think sure. I mean, maybe that's the honesty of it. That the honest, and the honesty is what makes it so important. Um, I would love to see if I would love to see somebody who's really rich now come back and do some stand up. I think I'd like to see what Jim Carrey could do. You know, because yeah. he is so on the other side of, of things. It would be great to kind of see him go out and, and talk about life because he's always been so honest about you know depression and being homeless and things like that. To kind of see where his life is, where he's he's taken, you know, he's he's been to the top of the mountain and then he's actually, you know, and then he's had his ups and downs. Um, that would be really interesting. I would love to see that. I'm not sure. I think that might be frightening at this point in his life. He's kind of like batshit crazy anymore. All the better. Well, I think I think all the great ones are right, and that's that's another good thing. Yeah, you have to be. Probably. Yeah, I mean they're all. Yeah, I, I yeah. think to be so funny and relevant for so long, your you, your perception's got to be different, right? You got to be looking at things differently than oh hey look you know that glass is half full. You know where somebody like Robin Williams would take the glass and bash it over his head and say now it's you know, now this is how I see it. Now it's that. Um, so you know I think they're all you know especially the guys who are touring all the time you know you have your george carlin's i think you know somebody like george carlin who'd been doing this for so long and was able to stay relevant for so long you know you have to wonder you could be like what's that guy like you know in in, in real life because you know you have to look at things from kind of a almost a not really a tormented way but maybe um to to, to, to find the funny in that Definitely. And I think with like George Carlin, a lot of his was like observation humor where it's like mm-hmm. he was just kind of looking at the world and especially the when he was first started, the dirty words you can't say on television. It's like it, he was basically pointing out like how ridiculous it was that you can't say these words and like how people freak out. Funny because it really is a ridiculous thing in real life. And I, he, he was really good at that, I thought. Then you watch like the, the first, you know, Saturday Night Live where George Carlin mm-hmm. was the host. And uh, he jokes about how, you know, they take knives and things off you when you go on planes, but they give you, a, like, a butter knife. And he's like, if you try hard enough, you could slit somebody's throat with that. <laughs> and he, t- he literally, he jokes about hijacking a plane. Like, yeah. And, uh, and then, you know, he, go, he went on, in the, you know, to do his stand-up in the 90s. He was the, uh, the narrator for the Thomas the Tank Engine uh, oh, stop motion right. television series. Yeah, and then don't forget him playing Ben Affleck's dad in a uh, Jersey Girl. Don't forget that. Oh yeah, where he got he he got to do uh, Sweeney Todd on stage with the little girl. 
<laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. And even then, that was it was really funny in that. Um, you know, it was uh, it, it's and I think maybe what you guys are touching on is maybe the evolution of comedy too. Like, where does it go? And I think uh, if you're really good at um, and Dan touched on it with Robin Williams, and we talked about it a little bit with Schumer, but uh, I mean, look at Steve Martin. You know, Steve Martin was the guy who came out with an arrow through his head. You know, and then you know it was kind of the '70s, and he was doing movies, really silly movies. And then in the '80s, he started to do with you know Your Father or the Bride and Your Roxanne's. Then the '90s, he started to write for the New York Times and write novels. You know, and then you know, so he's just always evolved with things. Now he's playing banjo. <laughs> you know, so he's he's back to playing banjo. But I mean, like so at, it, at the same yeah. time, like I I go back and I watched that when I saw the first Saturday Night Live with George Carlin. Like I genuinely laugh at what he's doing then. You know, and yeah. he, he stays like that throughout. But then, like, you look at um, Andy Kaufman, again, on that first Saturday Night yeah. Live, where he just plays the Mighty Mouse theme, and whenever it says, you know, here he is <laughs> to save the day, he just opens his mouth and, like, waves his arm, and, like, everybody laughs. Yeah. And I'm like, like, I, I don't get it. Like, is that something from the day? Like, is that just, <laughs> you know, part of comedy of the 70s that, you know, you just do something... Uh, to me, it's just stupid. Like, there's there's no comedy to it. Like, there yeah. wasn't, like, any kind of effort or anything I, put into it. I think with Andy, I'm, and I'm yeah. sorry, you go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I think with Andy, it was, uh, well, Andy was doing his own thing. You know, I think there's, if there's going to be comedy classes, you're going to have your Andy Kaufman. And that's pretty much going to be Andy Kaufman by himself in that in that, in that group. Um, I saw a little bit of it with Tom Green and when he uh, when he was doing his thing for a little bit. Um, a little bit with Sasha Baron Cohen, you know, where he just stays in character the whole time. Um, but uh, I think Andy Kaufman, it was just about him navigating, trying to find something that hadn't been done before. Um, and here he is in this golden age. I mean, the 70s where you had your Richard Pryors and you had your George Carlins and you had your Steve Martins and all of that. Um, he's out there and he's he's just doing something completely weird and different. And uh, he's got his fans. You know, there's a, I, there was a, I think there was a there was a meme or I don't know how you say it, Mimi, um, where <laughs> because of all the craziness going on in the world currently, that this is just one big Andy Kaufman prank. You know, so he was the one yeah. guy who could die, and people aren't really sure if he's dead or not. That this might be some uh, elaborate thirty-year prank. Um, so yeah. I think with Andy Kaufman, he was always just pushing the bar, um, and I think people it rub, did rub people the wrong way. Where it seems like you know, I but think also, he was uh, sort of he was yeah, sort of ahead of the troll thing. You know, like like he wrestled women on TV. Like yeah. like he just I think he reveled in being a troll, kind of. Oh man, he was, was the first ever troll. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that was his thing. Yeah, he's absolutely absolutely right. When making up characters and staying in character, and yeah. and then pulling one eighty exactly. where he's the standing Tony. next to his characters, and yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tony Clifton, right? <laughs> Tony Clifton, the the lounge singer, and then I think at one point he joined them on stage. You know, where it's oh, like, yeah, because oh, he had me. Bob playing, the, the manager playing Tony, and then he's yeah. like, oh, I'm not Tony. <laughs> so I think it was Andy. I mean, that was Andy, just you know, just trying to stay ahead of the curve, or or, or yeah. he was just doing his own thing, you know. Yeah. Uh, Another one of those classic comedians that I, I want to ask about because it's another one that I just don't get, and it, it may just be because I have a terrible sense of humor. But <laughs> Jerry Lewis, I, can somebody explain Jerry Lewis to me and, yeah. and why he is considered like one of these all-time great comedians? <laughs> well, the voice, the voice rubbed me the wrong way too. I remember trying to watch those movies when I was younger, and. Uh, it was the voice. After a while, I'm just tapping out. Um, but he was doing. He was always writing and developing his own thing. You know, he was doing his own movies. He was writing his own movies. He was directing his own movies. Um, he was hanging out with Dean Martin. You know, so I mean, it was. He was always trying to try something different. Um, where I mean, if you look at um, it was the Bellboy, and then it was a uh, Nutty Professor. And I love both versions of the Nutty Professor, which is uh I know probably blasphemous, but I love Eddie Murphy. Um, <laughs> You know, it was a uh, he was a good actor when he got you know when he wasn't doing the voice. Um, yeah, I think people like those elaborate like um, injury scenes, you know, where he's, he's like rolling down a golf course for, for <laughs> a while. You know, I think I think that was just it was kind of like the buffoonery, the buffoon yeah. kind of doing that. And, but then he also was the smartest guy in the room a lot, where he w he was comfortable being the buffoon because he was also writing the script where he knew at the end he was going to be able to tell his story um, by making himself the buffoon. So I think that's probably why he's regarded like that. Um, I do see him 
in every interview being just incredibly cranky and hateful towards other comedians, which I don't agree with. Um, because, uh, I mean, yeah, he was, he was there, he was there early. Um, but it doesn't make anybody less, any less funny than him. Um, but yeah, he's, uh, every time I hear him speak, I'm like, Oh, oh good Lord. I felt bad. For, I feel bad for the journalists. Well, it sounds, sounds like with his writing and his acting and everything, he had just like a very diverse background. And does, yeah. that, does that, I mean, does that add into the comedy aspect of, of being funny, being able to translate that, from your words to somebody else to physicality to uh, to all these different aspects, I definitely think so. Yeah, and it's I mean, on, in both both the Nutty Professors, uh, the Eddie Murphy one and the Jerry Lewis one, you could see that. Um, where I mean, Eddie Murphy was he was he was his entire family, you know. <laughs> and you're looking at that, you're like, this is uh, one actor, you know. They he would say his <laughs> lines, and he would go be another character, and and that's and that's something we should probably talk about too at some point. Is like why in these incredible performances aren't these guys getting their academy award nominations like why did eddie murphy had to go do dream girls to finally get his academy love when he's over there playing an entire family convincingly in the movie yeah uh, like and you really love that family you really love them you kind of felt and you never you just forgot that it was him and being all of these characters um you know and i think that was the same thing (laughs) that that got jerry lewis a lot of love early um, we don't see it that much anymore. I think we saw, I mean, Melissa McCarthy got her Oscar nomination for, um, Sean Spicer. No, she got it for Bridesmaids. She got her nomination for that. And, uh, and she was great in it, I thought. <laughs> um, but we don't see enough of it. Like, why aren't we seeing, um, guys like this be rewarded? Um, it's, it's, it's hard to do comedy, you know, try to get somebody who's won a bunch of Oscars like Daniel Day-Lewis or Sean Penn. Go have them be Ace Ventura. See how that works. You know, <laughs> I would love to see that, by the way. Um, yeah, I think, I think I Sean mean, Penn could, is one of those actors like, um, y- you know, how um, how Kevin Smith had said about Ben Affleck, like he could play the the shark in Jaws and it would, he would do a great Jaws. job. Like Sean Penn is one of those actors. I think he could play he could play the shark in Jaws and, and do fabulous. Like, yeah, yeah. Oh, he's great. And then Daniel Day-Lewis would actually become a shark. He would be walking around in, um, you know, shark skin. You know, they would do that. Um, but, uh, yeah, I just <laughs> wonder where, I mean, where, why are these guys getting, getting the love that they deserve from these kind of things? Because when people go to these movies, they want to laugh. And I'm not saying, you know, go give so-and-so an award for, you know, neighbors or something like that. But you do see some great performances in comedy, and I feel like they often get overlooked because they are lumped into the, 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 the comedy category. And I don't, I don't um, think I can name one time where a comedy won one of the big awards, you know, best picture, writing, director, actor, or no. actress. Like, no, when I was can't, the last I can't time a comedy think of it. Right, 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 right. Yeah. And a lot of times if you're going to get... Fargo comedy, was kind of like a dark comedy, but, that, but it's very rare. I'm sorry, which one? Very rare. He said Fargo. Oh, Fargo, Fargo. Yeah, the Coen brothers. Yeah, the Coen brothers do that. Um, the Coen brothers, are, we'll lump them into like a Pulp Fiction American Psycho category. We are like, why am I laughing at this right now? <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, if you think yeah. about that, though, um, Jeff Richards has been nominated a lot in the last couple of years. Where was his nomination for Big Lebowski? I thought he was terrific. Sure, he should have won. Yeah, like John Goodman. Like, you know, that was, you know, where, where were all the nominations for that one? Um, the Coen brothers are an Academy favorite. Like, people love to get nominate them. But here they are. They're being genuinely very funny. Um, John Goodman should definitely should have been nominated. And, uh, but, you know, they, it got lost. Maybe it's because there's too many laughs in it. Or maybe they're just saying, well, you know, we, it's not dark enough. Or we need to have, you know, more serious things in it. But it, it, it really could could take a, a few uh, lessons from even the Golden Globes where you can see these guys um, get nominated for these things for, for being funny. I don't think a lot of people for some reason really view comedy as an art. It's like, it seems like with a lot of it, they're like, all right, well, this person did this and then they started doing serious movies. It's like, no, mm-hmm. I mean, the comedy is like, there is, there's definitely an art to making comedy and like not everybody can do it. I mean, there's yeah. a lot of failed comedy out there and a lot of failed comedians. So it takes oh, like Adam Sandler. Sure. Yeah. I think young Sandler was this sort of crazy energy, interesting guy. And now he's like very lazy, very it's sort of standard. He does the same thing every time. But now, you know, and go just, back and look at. Yeah. yeah. You know, I don't. It's Little Nicky is one of my favorite he, like comedies. And, you know, to, to see what yeah. Adam Sandler has become now is just an atrocity. <laughs> well, what do you guys think about when Adam Sandler goes serious? Yeah. I, I've I've seen I've always been I've actually been really impressed yeah. when he decides to turn on the dramatic. Yeah, it was like, great in the uh, uh, John Apatow movie where he yeah. was uh, a better yeah, funny comedian. people. Funny people. I thought, yeah, I thought yeah. he was great funny in that. People. I yeah, like him too. in um, the Paul Thomas Anderson Punch Drunk Love. 
Yeah, yeah. I've, I've actually never seen him in a serious role. I think there's like, a dark side to him that he's I explore. saw Funny People a while back. He just seemed very disorganized to me. I mean, Stranger Than Fiction keeps popping up into my head, but I know I know that's Will Ferrell. That's yeah, not Adam that's Sandler. In which one? Uh, Stranger Than Fiction with Will Ferrell. Oh, that was that's good. Yeah, it was good in that. Well, and that's and I, I just like I imagine Adam Sandler's kind of like that, where it's like, like he can do a good job, ser- like doing something serious. But nobody wants to see him do something serious, so yeah. they just kind of lop him back into these roles where, anymore, like Will Ferrell anymore, he seems to get typecast. Like you're this lovable idiot, and that's all the direction that you get. Like the same yes. point, at the same point, they'll get criticized <laughs> for playing the same role, but when they try to branch out, then it's like, oh well, you suck at this. Go back to doing. Your- <laughs> <laughs> Go back and do another one. Yeah. Like oh, nobody uh, wanted to see that. Similar, it does do some interesting stuff. Um, when he's given the artistic freedom to do it. Um, and uh, I, I know we keep kind of going back to Robin Williams, but there's, it was interesting that um, the same director who did Robin Williams in um, Dead Poets Society's Peter Weir um, also did Jim Carrey in The Truman Show, right? Now, those are two very manic comedians, and somehow this director was able to unlock both of them and just direct them in these incredible performances. Um, I'm wondering if it's maybe ah. it's because it's the director, do you think, you know, with Adam Sandler, when we, the two movies we spoke about were directed by Paul Thomas Anderson and then um, Judd Apatow. You know, does Judd he just Apatow. need uh, just do, do just need a, a, a great director to, to kind of keep him on on track so he can do these interesting performances? Yeah, Robin Williams is really good at side comedy. Really good good at everything except Bicentennial Man. Never was saw amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Never seen it. Would um, you guys have given him an Oscar for uh, Mrs. Doubtfire? Mrs. Doubtfire would be something that I'm surprised I, I would have, would have given him an Oscar. An Oscar. I would have I given him all the Oscars to Death to Smoochie the year that came out. I don't care. Remember that movie. one? Yeah, that was a Whatever crazy movie. movie came, whenever yeah. it won that year, nothing else should have won, and they should have all went to Death to Smoochie. That was an interesting movie. That, that, that was really interesting. That is probably my all-time favorite comedy. And that's, yeah. and that's where you have a, a, an yeah. actor who's not, you know, generally wow. a, a, comedi- a comedic actor. Um, God, why can't I think of his name? Um, Ed Norton. Yeah. Um, as Sheldon Edward, Mopes, yeah. who is this extremely funny character. And you've got Robin Williams playing the whole gamut from, like... Mm-hmm. You know, very like very serious at times. You know when you know I'm Rainbow fucking Randolph. Like I don't <laughs> give a shit. Just give me the goddamn money. To like this, you know, crazy. It's a penis. It's Mr. Wiggle Daddy. It's the one-eyed wonder weasel. Like he just he just goes from one spe- end of the spectrum to the other, and it's it's amazing to see what you know those actors are capable of in that movie. Because on the other side, you know, Ed Norton does the same thing where he goes from that, you know, Sheldon Mopes, you know, mm-hmm. I'm drinking alfalfa and orange juice to, like, I'm going to shoot, you know, the yeah. the short Italian guy for robbing my ice ice skating show. Yeah. No. And uh, it's funny. I was in uh, it's a funny story about Smoochie. I was in uh, New York around when they were filming that and uh, they were filming it in Times Square. But I didn't realize it because, and I just walked by a giant billboard with an Ed Norton and a dinosaur outfit and it said Smoochie Town. I'm like, what the fuck is going on right now? <laughs> like, there was no cameras around. It's just like they had the uh. billboard up for it. And uh, I was, I, I it just stopped myself in the middle of Times Square, which is, you're, you're going to get run over. Um, but uh, uh. yeah, it was, it was super <laughs> funny. You guys want to talk about how Bill Murray's kind of turned on the Jets, right? He kind of went from Bob Wiley and What About Bob and Groundhog Day to uh, popping up and all of a sudden, he's got this amazing second act in his career where all of a sudden he's showing up in Rushmore yeah. and uh, Lost in Translation. Yeah. And then what was came out last yeah. year? Saint, uh, Saint Vincent? I mean, he was terrific in these things. Oh, he's yeah. playing like this old, bitter yeah, yeah. character. Yeah, but he's been great. Like he's been wonderful. He's been heartbreaking in them. But he still makes you laugh. I feel like with Bill Murray, he kind of knows where he is in life. Like, he knows, like, he's getting older and everything, and he kind of just goes with it. He's not trying to be, like, go back to his glory days. He goes, yep, here I am now, and that's how I'm going to act. And it works really well for him. He's kind of, just comes up as really genuine. Well, it, it helps that he's become, like, this pop culture kind of icon, too. Oh, yeah, yeah. Especially, um, I mean, just, just like his role in Zombieland, you know, his little yeah. cameo in himself. that. Yeah. <laughs> he, he played himself. <laughs> playing a zombie like yeah also too with like the resurgence of ghostbusters and stuff even though you know it wasn't him like that brought his like some of his iconic stuff from the 80s back to today um and i think repopularized him um and again he's one of those genuinely good actors that can he can play 
You know, he can do the drama, he can do the comedy, and he can make it work and puts his own spin onto it. Yeah, he's been he's been really great to watch my entire life. I've just really enjoyed. And it's funny about him in the way where he never really conformed to Hollywood standards either. He doesn't have an agent. He has a what is a one eight hundred number. And you call that one eight hundred number and you leave a voicemail <laughs> and he may or may not check it. And uh, that's how you get it. And it, apparently when they were shooting Lost in Translation, I mean they were in Japan, wow. they were shooting without him. They didn't know if he was gonna land or not that day. Like they were trying to figure out what to do in case he wasn't on there. Like he committed to it, but there was no way to reach him. So they left all the yeah. information on his one eight hundred number, and then one day he just randomly showed up at eight o'clock in the morning or whatever, and and that was it. But uh, he doesn't conform. He doesn't, and maybe that's why he's been so interesting to watch. He doesn't get caught up in the Hollywood politics. Yeah, I think um, there's a real authenticity to him. Also, yeah, like lots of translation, you could see him being that guy. You know, he's like. There's a sort of sadness to him meets, like, sarcastic humor. You know, mm-hmm. I, I think there's that's part of his appeal now, also. It's like, he seems like he's playing himself, kind of, you know? He yeah. comes off as very genuine as, like, a, an actual person that has a lot of different sides to him rather than just, like, a character in a movie. Yeah, and I think after, you know, a couple of years in the business, I think my favorite thing to do now is hear Bill Murray urban legends folklore, you know, <laughs> he'll be shooting something like in Pittsburgh or something like that. And he'll show up in a, in a college <laughs> party and just start talking about life. And then he'll walk out and everyone's like, was that Bill Murray? That was just here for an hour. Um, yeah. you know, and then there was a story I just read about him. I guess That's his son, popping up on social media. Yeah. yeah <laughs> where his son, uh, his son, his son opened a bar or something like that. Yeah. And, in Greenpoint. Uh, right. Uh, he, yeah. He should. Yeah. Right there. And he showed up to, uh, to help bartend. Like one night, he wasn't taking anybody's <laughs> money, and for everyone who was doing a shot, he was doing a shot with them, you know. Like, and then he—that was it. That was the end. And he walked away, and he helped his son out, and got a ton of press, and and then he's headed off into the night. He's kind of like the Sasquatch of Hollywood. He is. <laughs> the Batman of <laughs> If he's even in Hollywood, we don't even know. He just kind of lives in a cave and emerges once every <laughs> seven years, like. Like a Groundhog Day. I see where you're going with. <laughs> um, no, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a story about how he booked onto St. Vincent, and it was kind of the same thing, where the 1-800 number again came up. Um, and the screenwriter, I guess he had a P.O. box and a 1-800 number. That's all he had. And the screenwriter sent him St. Vincent. And um, then out of nowhere, just one day, he calls him. And he's like, okay, let's meet. I'm going to pick you up right now. <laughs> he shows up in a limo, and you know, all of a sudden you're meeting with Bill Murray like it happens <laughs> that quickly. Like, I'm around the corner from your house. Um, and then... You know, an hour later, he's like, we should do this. We should do the script. And that's how we did that. So, uh, yeah, I tell you, everybody should just go and, and, and go find your Bill Murray folklore. It's fantastic. <laughs> if you're trying to make a movie, call the Bill Murray 1-800 number. He might show up. <laughs> but nobody knows the 1-800 number. That's even passed around where people aren't sure if it's the uh, 1-800 number because it's not saying, hi, I'm Bill Murray, leave a message. It's just leave a message. Yeah, you know, that's it. So nobody knows what, if the number's right. Yeah. Nobody knows if he's getting it. Um, <laughs> it's uh, it's great. It's it, in this day and age, it's just fantastic that somebody doesn't play a, a, for any of the rules like that. You know, it goes completely yeah. against the grain. You would use your one eight hundred number. It's pretty retro. <laughs> it's pretty great, right? Yeah, you have to call it collect. Like there's no <laughs> other way to get through. <laughs> What's it say? Anybody's gonna pick that phone up and, get, and take it? It's not a one nine hundred number. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's definitely strange because i feel like with a lot of comedy you definitely benefit from being more of an average person than you do from being like a superstar like you could be really famous like bill murray but it's better if you like despite all his fame he still comes off as a regular person and yeah i think that people just in general like to relate to others i think that's like one of the main things of comedy like you look at like people on youtube one of the most um, popular things is um, people watching people play video games. And it's such a weird thing, just like watching people make jokes playing video games. But um, it it kind of helps people feel like you know they're these are people they know and kind of feel like they're involved in something. And I think people like Bill Murray managed to pull that off despite how famous they've been they've become. Because there's a sense of comfort. There's a sense of comfort to him, and he does feel like a guy that you probably just you know watch a football game next to and have a beer with, you know? And I think people like that. People people find that accessibility uh, to be endearing. I like the kind of connection with um, other people. I, I, w- I yeah. want to talk about a comedian who, who is not seen as, as normal and whose legacy has amounted to nothing more than a theme song. And that is, cool. that is Benny Hill. Oh. 
Now that's interesting because there is it's it's that it's that British dry wit. Um, and again, people people love that kind of stuff. And, and like um, his, when, when he was on the air, he was in I think thirty seven different countries. His show was yeah. airing in, like it was it uh, in its day. It was the most translated TV show. Wow! Like it's it's insane to like look up stuff on it and find out, like uh, as popular as it was. Uh, my my father in law, I guess, used to watch it in the eighties, which I mean, I, I I assume all men did because it was just half naked women running around most of the show <laughs> um, but like and, and to me like you know and that was what like the big viewership was was the the perverted aspect mm -hmm. but like uh, we, we bought him like a dvd collection and like i watched a couple episodes and i'm like the the actual comedy parts to me are hysterical yeah but like then you get to those parts and it just kind of like is like 10 minutes of women in bikinis running around <laughs> and i'm like okay can we get back to like the funny parts like yeah like he's well, a comedian that, that he stands out because of the pervert stuff, but like it, he he gets lost in that, and that's his legacy. Um, when he generally had like some good stuff in there, but I mean that's what he did to stand out. Yeah, well, I think it's it's, it's probably the same reason. I mean, with the popularity overall, it might be the same reason why Baywatch as a TV show uh, before it was a movie starring Dwayne the Rock Johnson um, was. Uh, was so popular. I think it was syndicated in uh, something like 50 countries. Um, I think there is yeah. there is a market for that. And if you're funny like Benny Hill, and but you really want to be worldwide known, maybe maybe he had the right he had the right ingredients. You know, he's like, okay, I you know I can I can do X amount of business in these countries, or I could pick up syndication everywhere else by putting all these other all these other factors in. And to go on that, since um, you were saying that you know his comedy was really funny, you thought his comedy was really funny, but he's known for the perverted things. Well, most guys like naked women, so or women in um, bikinis and all that. So it's that's something that's universal. Whereas I think um, most stand-up comedy, it's very, it, it's not going to hit everybody. So it's kind of yeah. like finding something that will, which is, as far as comedy goes, is very difficult. I don't really, I don't really think there's any kind of comedy that everyone will laugh at. I think that. You'll have an audience, and maybe a big audience, but there's always going to be people that don't like it, and you're never going to be able to get everybody. And I'm not really sure if it's why that is. Some people just maybe are just aren't conditioned for it. Some people just just kind of find different things funny, but yeah. it's definitely strange how that works. Oh, definitely. I think it's a. Uh, I mean, if you look at you know, every every comedian wants to play Madison Square Garden. If you look at a couple that have played Madison Square Garden, you couldn't get any different. You know, where you had Andrew Dice Clay that played Madison Square Garden. You had Steve Martin that played on it. You know, so you have like Dane Cook played Madison Square Garden. You know, Amy Schumer. Those are diff so much, so many different types of comedy, and you have a packed house for all of them. So there is absolutely uh, a certain type of audience or a certain type of crowd for everything. Um, it's just a matter of, of of what are you doing with it? How do you keep yourself relevant? Um, Amy Schumer from what I hear in New York, writes, I mean, still writes all the time. I think she put out something like two specials back to back and, um, you know, and she'll watch tape of herself and just continue to grow and, 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 you know, can evolve with what she's trying to do. Um, so, I mean, it's, a, I think a lot of it is just, um, who are they connecting with? Kind of finding your audience. Like, I don't think that there's really a wrong way to do comedy. Like there are comedies I think that are bad, but there's always something where I'm like, oh, this is stupid. No one's going to watch this. And it ends up having like a huge thing. Like, um, is that show on, on, um, on Adult Swim? Um, was it Tim and Eric or something like that? I watched like one episode. I'm like, this is stupid. No one's ever going to watch this. And then I found out like after that it had a huge following. I'm like, well, I was wrong about that. I, like, I feel that way for like a, a robot chicken on Adult Swim. Like, oh. you missed with that one. I, you know, and, and, you know, I know people that absolutely love that show, and I just watch it, and I'm like, man, I just want to go, like, kick a puppy or something. Like, it, it just, <laughs> it just <laughs> makes me feel that, like, terrible. Like yeah, there's that. adult, there's adult swim shows, and they, they have huge audiences. And merchandising, I mean, they really, uh, adult swim gets it right. You know, they, uh, they have their audiences, and they, and they, uh, they play right to them. They have, I mean, I see T-shirts. I see robot chicken T-shirts. Um, you know, that was it. Seth Green. Seth Green that does that one. Yep. Yeah. Good for him. Another guy that keeps evolving. You know, he was in 
'90s teen movies, and he's evolving too. I think that's a uh, it's a kind of a recurring theme here. But I mean, that's that's a really interesting uh, direction I, he I took. I always and remember him as Scott uh, Evil. Scott Evil, yeah. <laughs> You know, I went right to yes, it. I can't I'm hardly wait. I, 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 I don't I gotta, know why. I got to roll. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, uh, I got you. Yeah, thanks so, for joining so, us, Dan. Yeah, you guys keep sending the conversation. I really appreciate you having me on that. And, uh, uh, Dan, do you just want to plug? Right, like, where can we, where can uh, yeah, we, we find stuff from you? Uh, check out uh, Pool Party on YouTube. All right. All right. Thank you, Dan. Thanks a lot. All right, Dan. As far as, like, comedy, I don't think that there is, like, a universal comedy, but I think, like, things that are kind of, like, slightly absurd kind of, for the most part, hit most people. Like, I think if you look at most um, comedy around the world, there's at least some patterns of things that are just slightly off. Like, you'll have somebody in a crowd who's, yeah. you know, wearing, like, a clown costume or just, like, something bizarre. And it's, like, no one's, like, just kind of out there and seeing people's reactions. I think... People tend to find that pretty funny because it's just like, yeah. like what the heck. But I, as far as jokes go, I don't really think there's anything that's super universal. Um, what do you guys think? I think uh, I mean, if you look at, I mean, if you could you could talk to anybody, and the, the craziest thing I always hear in the comedy circles, and normally I hear it from like people my parents' age, where they say Saturday Night Live hasn't been funny since you had Gilda Radner, John Belushi, and all that. And of course, that was a great lineup, without a doubt. But it's been relevant for 40 years, right? I mean, it's, you know, even when people, even through the phases where it's quote unquote not good, um, I mean, there's still, there's still people, people still talk about it. I mean, people are still watching it. Um, I mean, I think that's, and that's 40 years. I mean, how many, pre, you know, it's how many presidencies do they go through since then? Um, and how many issues, how many things? Um, and it's still trying to stay somewhat topical um, or, you know, and, and, and at the best case, really funny. Um, and I think that's, I think that's, interesting how they've always been able to kind of stay the course on that um even in the seasons where you're you know you can get that many laughs out of it i I have to say that i believe wholeheartedly there is a pun out there for everyone there is not a person on this earth that you can go through like 20 different puns and they won't find at least one of them funny (laughs) i just i i'm I'm a big i love i love puns and i believe that everybody out there like deep down inside no matter how much they say you know, they hate puns. I, I believe everybody has a fondness for puns somewhere deep down in their heart. Oh, yeah. If you, especially if you hit them the right way. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, and that's, and that's the, that's kind of the comedian's, you know, weapon of choice. You kind of have to just figure out what, what's going to get the audience to, to react, um, and react favorably to you. Um, I mean, there's been times where I've, I've been on a stand up tour, you know, and I'm in New York and I'm like, oh, man, I, you know, these jokes aren't hitting as well. Um, you know what I'm talking about, whatever. But then I know that there's a couple that would work. You know, when you're talking a little closer to home and you're a little more personal with yourself, those seem, they was just like we kind of talked about earlier, um, people can relate to that. And, you know, so it's all about kind of navigating, just finding finding the niche, finding what people are going to enjoy and people are going to laugh at. And it's an ongoing experience. I don't think anybody's gotten it quite right. Um, I heard a thing about Jerry Seinfeld where they said, uh, you know, how do, how do you stay funny how you stay relevant he said I, I treat this like a job he's like i i work from nine to five writing um so i mean i think I, you know i think that's how that's how he does what he does um but everyone's got their own different philosophies and their own different ways of working and uh i think that's i think it's just interesting that it's 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 an art form and it's just like any if you bring in musicians in a hundred different musicians and say hey what do you think this note means to you you're gonna get a hundred different answers i think it's just as long as it connects um to people and it makes them feel good or makes them laugh or makes them think i I think these guys are doing their jobs and i think i think what you brought up is it's an essential ability and that's to be able to read your read your audience if you're you know doing stand-up or to be able to read your um you know your your target crowd whenever you're writing Mm -hmm. and you know you don't write to try and please everyone but you look at you know what demographic am i looking at i mean i did the same thing when i was working in a haunted house you know, I would see what kind of crowd was coming through that would be, you know, approaching my room next. I wouldn't, you know, say the same thing to a group of 12-year-old kids that I would say to a group of, you know, 50-something-year-old adults. Yeah. You know, you, you modify your lines, you modify, you know, your jokes, your punchline, and that to hit your audience and to make sure that you're, you know, doing things the best that you can to get the reaction that you want. Exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah, and that's. I think that's. And I think that's key. And, and it's. And you knew that immediately. You're like, okay, this is. 
a different audience. I'm going to adjust things to if, if my jokes aren't working or if my if my lines aren't working. Um, the same thing when you're working in film. You know, sometimes if you're going in and you're trying to do a, a, a scripted line, uh, it might in somebody's brain sound one way, but when people start saying it, it doesn't sound the same. So you're like, okay, this line isn't working. Let's try to figure this out. You know, let's try to let's try to go back and, and, and try to get this to work again. Um, and I think that's I mean, it's just it's just refining it. It's trial and error. Just keep going, you know. And I think the the greats are the ones who've never really taken their foot off the gas. They just keep working. Uh, we go back to you know Steve Martin. When he got bored with stand-up, he started doing movies. When he got bored with movies, he started writing books. You know, so you know he's he's a guy who's always pushing himself in some sort of platform um, to reach an audience and to be funny and to be intellectual, get his message across. And uh, I think that's I think that's admirable. I think it's in- incredible. Definitely, I think that if people are having fun, you can kind of tell people like seeing other people have fun because it lets them feel like they're included in something. I've seen a bunch of times people will work develops like some kind of comedy act or show and it won't do all that well but somebody on the internet will do something like real fast and that'll get like a million hits because yes. they were just having fun with it and they kind of yeah. managed to connect really fast with them when i think that brings it back to like you know comedy a lot of times is perceived as something that is genuine does it feel mm-hmm. genuine yeah and that's why you know candid camera and fucking punked and yeah um uh, God, what's that shitty thing with Tom Bergeron? Um, America's Funniest Home Videos, <laughs> where Tom Bergeron is the worst thing on that. Because he tries to be funny, and he's not. Tries to be Bob Saget. Um, and it's just one of those things where, yeah, things that things that are real, um, they just kind of you know have a tendency to make you laugh. Like, you don't want to see someone force it out. And that's, yeah. that's a big turnoff in comedy, in my opinion, is that forcefulness of, this is going to make you laugh because I think it's going to, and I'm going to make sure it turns out that way. Yeah. Whereas you just kind of have to flow with it and, it, again, be natural and genuine. Yeah, being honest. Yeah, being honest with yourself. Um, I think that's what a lot of the ones – I think they, they, they're funny, but they take their comedy seriously. They want to do it right. Um, but then you, you – know, but you're right. Then you see something like America's Funniest Home Videos. Um, I think people can connect with that because they just – it was an un, – you can't plan that reaction. Um, and also, uh, my, my, uh, my little guy, my, my son has just started watching America's Funniest Home Videos. It's not Tom Bergeron anymore. It's um, Carlton. It's uh, Alfonso Ribeiro. Oh, <laughs> He's awesome. does, does he do the dance? <laughs> He does do the dance because now my son does it. And I'm looking at him like, what? how are you doing the Carlton? Where'd you learn this? Now, does, does, um, he, do, does he do a better job than Tom Bergeron? <laughs> I, you know, I, I feel like, yes. I hadn't watched a whole lot of America's Funniest Home Videos in a really long time. But I think the fact that we're talking about how that song show has been on for a very long time, they've got the recipe right. Um, they're, you know, they're, it's, it's quick. You know, these are quick laughs. Um, these are people that are sending this stuff in. I mean, the, the job pretty much does it for themselves. Um, and people are still laughing at it. So there, again, there is an audience for that kind of stuff. Um, what about those, uh, what about the redneck comedy tour, the, the get her done guys and Larry, the cable guy, there's a huge audience for these guys. Um, I think just finding the material and finding the audience is how you're going to get your connection. Actually, I, be- I believe Bill Engvall was was just in the Pittsburgh area recently. I swear I saw signs that he was at the the Palace Theater in Greensburg. Oh wow! Um, yeah, I mean, they're, they're and they're still around and they're still, I guess, kind of relevant. Yeah, Jeff Foxworthy's doing ads for um, what's it, uh, Golden Corral or something like that. I saw I that. that. I huh? saw that. Dude, I love hey, Golden you know, Corral. And you know what? That's a national ad. So uh, Jeff Foxworthy got paid on that, yeah. but. Now you make another point. If you want to do your comedy and if you want to do things your way, maybe you have to do a Golden Corral Steakhouse commercial or buffet or whatever that is so you can keep doing interesting stuff and trying out new things to, to attempt to stay relevant with your stand-up. Pretty much, yeah. Sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I, I think to bring it all full circle, um, did, did we answer any of our questions here? Um, I think so, yeah. I don't think um, yeah. comedies for, like the same kind of comedy works for everybody, but I do think that certain things will like kind of, even if you don't find it hysterical, you'll get a chuckle from um, certain like universal things. Yeah. And then we have our own things that will strike a nerve. You know, if there's one thing that makes you laugh, um, you know, that's it, that's your thing. You <laughs> know, so. And that's important. You know, like we, with the, we were just talking about the uh, Charlie Murphy, who we lost today. 
um, when you would see him tell a story, there was just something so compelling about him. You know, he was telling the story and he was being really funny, but without trying. Like, he's just naturally funny. It's that Eddie Murphy, Charlie Murphy thing. Those guys just have funny genes. But, um, you know, it's it, when you see those, for me, it strikes a nerve. So I know I'm going to laugh because I'm going to – he's going to talk about Prince Flat, you know, making pancakes and playing basketball. You know, it's it's those things. But each person has their own set of things. You know, there might be people who don't think Chappelle's show is funny at all. Um, but, you know, people like that, you know, sarcastic humor. Everybody likes their own special thing, and I think that's what makes it so personal to us. And I think that's why people love it so much. One more thing that I wanted to just get you guys' opinion on. Do you think that there are any boundaries to comedy that people shouldn't go past? Like, do you think anything's just, like, blatantly offensive and shouldn't be joked about? Or, like, because that's something that seems to be brought up a lot more, like, nowadays. Like, it's certain things aren't okay to talk about, but I don't really know how, if anybody can really say that something's not funny if somebody finds it genuinely funny. It's it's very yeah. strange with that. I, I think comedy, uh, just like horror, it should be, I mean, there should be no holds barred. Um, you know, and again, if someone is doing it to try and be funny, like to try and like force it to be funny, it's not going to come across as funny. But if it's something like genuine and, you know, in, in what they're saying or how they're saying it, you, it, it may, you know, show them as not being a very good person. But, you know, that's that's what they find is funny and that's what they're trying to do. Then, you know, so be it. I mean, yeah, they might be an asshole, but you might be the bigger asshole for saying, oh, that's too offensive. You shouldn't be saying that. Like, you know, that's your opinion. And what they're saying is their opinion, too. And that's I mean, that's part of the First Amendment. You know, I don't have to like what you're saying, but I'll let you say it. Well, yeah, I think uh I think any anything it should nothing should be off limits, but I think if you're going to go there, make sure you have something interesting, like an interesting spin on it. You know, don't just say terrible shit just to say terrible shit. Uh, same like in horror, you know, where you're seeing things, you're like, okay, this is a little gratuitous. What's the point of this part in this scene? Um, you want to have a point. You want to go somewhere with it. You want to make sure. It's 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 an interesting spin on it. Um, I mean, you, you know, you, you look at uh, was it Mel Brooks were the producers where they made fun of Hitler? Yeah, springtime, so, I mean, spring for, Hitler. for Hitler. Yeah, springtime for Hitler, right? Like, it, you know, it's uh, if you can do it the right way, it can work. Um, but you you can't just do it just to do it. You can't just sit there and make Hitler jokes. You know, there needs to be a point or a way to go with it. Um, but if you're gonna do it, do it right. You know, and that's I think that's um, I don't think there's anything off limits as long as it's done correctly. There was a um, issue a couple of years ago. I don't know if you guys followed it. T.J. Miller, who's getting pretty famous these days, um, was uh, he and Dane Cook had an issue because Dane Cook was doing a stand up and it was post fame. Dane Cook, like where he was kind of doing well. Um, and it, it, Dane, it, T.J. Miller had an issue with how mean spirited it was coming. It wasn't so much funny as it was just mean. And he took issue with that. And that was actually a thing that became a thing between those guys. I'm not sure how it ended. Um, but, I mean, that was that was a thing where another comedian had taken issue with another one because it wasn't so much the material. It was just the mean-spiritedness, the, 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 the not – there was no point in it. It was just a guy maybe being mean about it. And I, I think maybe that's where maybe that's where he had a line, and that's where that was crossed. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of um, the comedian Christopher Titus, who will tell these stories about his life that are really depressing, but, like, a lot of them are kind of funny. It's, like, the way he turns yeah. around. Some of them, he'll end it where it's like, well, that was unpleasant. Like, that's, that just it kind of depresses me. Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, but I think I think that's it. I think it's, it's not so, so much, I mean, comedians, there should be some form of laughter in there somewhere. But, I mean, just, like, filmmakers... Just like, you know, what we're all doing here, we're all some form of storyteller, right? We're just telling our stories, and we just want people to feel something when we do it. Um, and I think that's what these comedians, I think that's what comedy does. And Chris Titus is great. What a great storyteller. I wish his show got a better, uh, had more of a chance. Um, but, uh, yeah, he's a great storyteller. 
And uh, it was Christian Finnegan, another guy who, who, who tours. Uh, these are guys who are really good at telling stories, um, you know, and sometimes they need to be depressing. But as long as you can bounce a bag and try to make it funny, um, I think you just want to make, make people feel, you know, and, have, and just find your, find your audience. And, and hopefully they'll, uh, they just take to what you're doing. Definitely. Yeah, sometimes I'll see comedians where, like, they'll make, like, a political statement. They'll make, get a bunch of, of applause. I'm like, okay, but where's the joke in that? I'm glad that you feel that way, I guess, and that you're getting an applause. But it's still a comedy show. So, like, I think that ultimately you have to have an act. You have to be telling a joke. Like, you can talk about, like, basically any kind of issue as far as I'm concerned. It could be controversial. It doesn't have to be. Like, some of the – there are some great comedians that aren't really controversial at all. But – I think that if you're not tying it into some kind of like humor or act, then mm-hmm. you're just kind of then you're just kind of like preaching to a choir, basically. You're just kind of like looking for validation for like something you're saying. Oh, definitely. You want to you want to have a direction. Like, where is this going? And I think that's I mean that's kind of when you're doing any type of comedy, you kind of want to think you're like, what? Where is this going? You know, where is my ultimate end point here? Um, and I think that's what they should be saying. I think people, I think it's really hacky. People are just sitting there just to yell things just to yell things, you know, or you're just, you know, doing something political. You're just saying like one line just to try to get, you know, web hits or, you know, so you could be on Access Hollywood or something like that. Have an end point, have a game plan, know where you're going with it. Um, the politics are fine. You know, you can, you can, on any side that you're on, um, there's enough to make fun of on the other side. <laughs> there's plenty to make fun of in politics. And uh, just make sure you have a point. Just make sure you're going somewhere with it. So uh, th- there are we, we've had a great like general conversation on general comedy, but there are yeah. some some more uh, some more aspects that perhaps we can talk about another time, such as you know situational comedies, ventriloquism as comedy, yeah, physical comedy, yeah, and one of my personal favorite, uh, harking back to the Jerky Boys, prank phone calls and uh, pranks in general, oh, man. but. Um, you know, I think that's I something to, to reserve for another conversation. That it's a great idea. Is, yeah, nowadays, pranking has evolved into trolling, it seems. <laughs> and tro- trolling. Yeah, I trolling. mean, trolling itself Get has, trolling. It's has really become funny. a big thing um, in the entertainment industry as well as our general lives um, as people. Yeah. And just like Dan mentioned, Andy Kaufman might have been the first troll. Um, but, uh, yeah, and let's also talk about uh, – when we talk next time, let's talk about, like, documentary humor, like mockumentaries, like your spinal taps and your best in shows and things yeah. like that. Let's talk about that too. I, th- I think we, I think we, we may Parodies have more than like one that. conversation <laughs> to, to come about at a later date. Definitely. We'll just have a six-hour – we'll just have a six-hour episode. We'll just tell everybody to uh, just get a cup of coffee and, uh, and just get through all of it with us. Your whole, whole work day's worth of us. <laughs> That's so, uh, work days of us just talking life. So Tim, no, that'd be great. I would love, I would love to come back on and talk to you guys. And I love, I love how this this whole conversation went all over the place. You know, we went from Steve to Benny Hill to Baywatch to Andy Call. Man, we, we covered some ground. So Tim, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, do you want to tell people where they can find you and uh, what you're all about, real quick? Oh, sure, sure, sure. Thanks, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm on. Uh, I'm over at Twitter. Um, I'm Tim underscore Car. And uh, C A R R. Um, I, I just joined Instagram. I'm not sure I like Instagram. It just seems like it's just a bunch of people and pictures of their elbows and their cats and their lunches. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm over there. And I just I just released um, a film. We were uh, we played for about a year in all the film festivals. It was called The Other Ripkin. It's a small film. It's a short comedy. Uh, I'm giving it away for free. Um, I just we just finished playing Maryland Film Festival last week. And uh, I put it for free on Vimeo right now under uh, Parking Lot Films. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a really fun film. We've played all over the world with it. Um, I put a link to it in, in uh, Twitter. So if you guys find me there, you'll be able to see it right there. But it's, it's free now. It's, uh, it, it's, it's played, uh, I think, it played from everywhere from California to Bali, Indonesia, which is great. Um, and everyone seemed to like it. You know, actually, we, we gave a speech about comedy there, too, how language doesn't really matter if we're all in on the joke, you know. Um, but, uh, yeah, if, if you hit me on Twitter, I'll follow everybody back. Um, just because I'm like that, um, but uh, yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, I'd be happy to keep the conversation going anytime with uh, with anyone. Definitely, and thanks for joining. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you guys so much. I hope Pittsburgh's treating you guys all well, right? Yeah, the weather's finally um, not freezing, so I'm happy with that. <laughs>
<laughs> That's nice. You know, I might be coming through this uh, this summer. I might uh, be going out to Ohio for a little bit. So I'll have to swing by and, uh, and try some of these sandwich places I've been hearing about up there. Yeah, hey, we'd love to show you around, get a beer or something. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. So until next time, friends, be brave, be alive, and be back for more. <laughs>